He is the last known person to talk to her before the abduction. We may never actually, it's weird to say that, we may never be able to solve this case. What is up guys, my name is Gabe. Today I'm gonna be talking about the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. Now this case took place back in 2006. It's been over 12 years, over a decade since this case was first talked about. They never were able to find her body. They did have certain leads saying that it could have been this person or that. I do wanna go step by step and try and see if we can solve anything together. If you guys wanna see more videos like this, please let me know in the comment section down below. I wanna get straight into the video, so here we go. Go. So I think that the first thing that we should do is just do a basic search of her name on Google, kind of see if there's any basic information before we go into the articles and videos that we may be able to find. Jennifer Joyce Cassie is an American woman who lived in Orlando, Florida and has been missing since January 24th, 2006. Her disappearance puzzled investigators and an aggressive search for her was conducted in the area surrounding her home. Her status is that she's been missing for 12 years, 9 months, and 12 days. That number, reading out loud, it's crazy. So let's start off with the Wikipedia page. Now, I know Wikipedia sometimes is not the most reliable source, so I'm gonna be looking at other articles and other sites as well. She was a graduate at the Vivian Gaither High School in Tampa Bay, Florida, and then attended the University of Central Florida in Orlando. So she moved and she graduated that in 2003 with a degree in finance. She visited St. Croix. Before all the people comment, guys, you said it wrong. I realize it's St. Croix. Virgin Islands, okay, just want to make that clear. St. Croix, not St. Croix, whatever I said. Okay, back to the video. With her boyfriend, and then right after returning was when she went missing. So there's a little bit of a red flag there. They don't even say his name, so I don't know if he's even accused. So the next part is the disappearance. Kessie was last seen on January 23rd, 2006 at approximately 6 p.m., leaving her place of employment, Westgate Resorts. Westgate Resorts is an American timeshare resort company. So that evening, she made several calls to her family and friends, and the last call was around 10 p.m. to her boyfriend. Once again, a slight red flag because it's the boyfriend, you know, not all cases involve the boyfriend, but I don't know if they're going to talk about their relationship at all, but if there's any sort of indication that they had some sort of like tension, typically Kessie would call or text her boyfriend every morning on her drive to work and wish him a good day. When Kessie failed to arrive at work that morning, her employer contacted her parents who immediately made a two hour drive. Her parents noticed that her car was missing, but upon entering her condo, they saw that nothing looked out of the ordinary. Evidence at her residence included a wet towel, clothes laid out, indicating that she actually never left that morning. So the last thing on the Wikipedia page is a timeline breaking down the Monday that she arrived back home, the Tuesday she went missing, and then the Thursday of that week. I don't know why that's involved. Maybe there's actually a lead at that point, but we will look into that afterwards. The first thing I do want to look at is that 6 p.m. time on that Monday. So Kessie got home from work. She returned home and called her family. This is the first time that she had been home since the vacation and the last time that her immediate family would ever hear from her. Then at 10 p.m., Kessie calls her boyfriend and talks for a little while before each of them are going to bed. He is the last known person to talk to her before the abduction. 7.30 a.m. Investigators initially believed that Kessie was abducted at some point after leaving her condo and walking to her car to go to work. They now believe that she was abducted at some point on the way to work. Then from 8 to 9, Kessie's boyfriend, who normally has heard from her by that point, calls her on the way to work, but it goes straight to voicemail. Her boyfriend assumes that she's busy, which most people would assume. 11 a.m. Kessie's co-workers are worried because she had not called in, all the calls to her phone went straight to voicemail, so her phone's obviously dead or been put on do not disturb. 12 o'clock, an apartment complex 1.2 miles away from Kessie's condo shows a hidden surveillance camera with an unidentified person parking Kessie's car. So I'm assuming that's the person. The car and the surveillance tape wouldn't be discovered until two days later on Thursday, January 26. Five to seven, Kessie's family and friends begin distributing flyers and pictures of her to people in the surrounding area, so they do a search party. After seeing Kessie's car on the news, a tenant at a nearby apartment complex calls the police to inform them of a car matching the description. Can you imagine if that tenant did not see the news that day? Like this case might not have ever even had a lead. A video clip showing the person who parked the car. Now you don't see a clear view of their face. In this image right here, you can see that there is a fence blocking it. 
and I wish that they could go frame by frame, but I don't think that's how this camera was set up. I think it's every few seconds it records, so every time the face is covered, which I don't want to say is a weird coincidence, but it's a weird coincidence. There's actually a feature length movie that just was released on digital download and will be soon released on Blu-ray called Searching, which is this week's sponsor of the Searching movie. I'll put a link down below at the top of the description. The movie is about a 16 year old that goes missing and her father, David Kim, has to go on a search trying to look for her. Now, I had to watch the movie twice because there are so many different clues within it that you kind of missed the first time. There's so many Easter eggs. Now, I'm gonna give you guys a head start if you actually get the Blu-ray copy in the menu. There's a secret file. If you go to that, there's a six minute video that shows you some Easter eggs that will help you during the movie. Now, if you do see the movie, please come back to this video afterwards and comment and let me know what you think of it. And I'll be replying to comments. We can have like a conversation about it. There's a Facebook page that I found called Help Find Missing Jennifer Kessie. The first thing that I did notice was the recent activity because people were still posting on this over a decade later. So July 15th, this guy named AC Debt said that he covered this just for his podcast. And one of the things that he initially speculated was that this guy, James Hathaway, had been involved in the disappearance. Now, we have no names attached to this besides her name, her parents, and we hear of the boyfriend, but we don't know who it is. I kind of want to look up quickly who her boyfriend was, if we can get his name, so we can kind of cross-connect. Her boyfriend's name was Robert Allen. So he's a nice looking dude, looks normal. So that's not the guy that they had just mentioned in the post. Let's look him up. James Hathaway, a state inmate who's a suspect in one of the most prominent missing persons cases in Central Florida. So Florida, he is 35, serving a life sentence for attacking a young woman at night in 2008. So the case that we're talking about takes place in 2006. So the jump between them is slightly off, but not saying it's not possible. This girl and the girl Jennifer that we're talking about are pale white and they have blonde hair so sometimes they will target a specific gender a specific hairstyle age group it's very interesting but it is something that they actually will look into so i'm not putting it past it justin the family received a tip just last month on jennifer's whereabouts right that's right, Matt, and that tip led them to Biscayne Bay that's in Miami. It's unclear what that tip said or who it was from, but it never did pan out. However, the family says it's tips like those that will ultimately find Jennifer. So this came out in April of 2018, so it came out this year. So keep in mind, like I said, that is 12 years for there to be a new tip. So right here is a part of the map of Florida where Key Biscayne is. And as you can see, it is an island off of Florida really, once again, leads me back to the possibility of her body has been disposed in this water and as time goes on, maybe it has decomposed. We may never be able to solve this case. In the years following Jennifer Kessie's disappearance, police have managed to track down her car, but not much else. Two days after the disappearance, police received a phone call from somebody who had seen a photo of her car on the news. Upon analyzing the car at the police crime lab, just two pieces of physical evidence were recovered a latent print deemed too minuscule to yield any helpful information and a small amount of DNA. So whoever did this knew what they were doing. They cleared all their DNA for the most part and all fingerprints because if there was even just one clear fingerprint, I feel like this would have been solved. The motive of the suspect was not robbery. So they're saying that it wasn't robbery, but her phone and purse are missing. I truthfully think that most things are planned out in advance. Whoever did this, was watching her for quite a long time and following her patterns. There's a lot of weird coincidence in this. Inmate says he has clues about the missing woman. David Russ, a convicted killer being held at the Seminole County Jail, spoke last week claiming he had information that could lead to a break in the case. Whenever there's a convicted killer trying to come forward, they're usually doing it for an exchange of a lowering of their sentence. They don't know any information about this girl. Who knows if it's true. I found his actual mugshot in 2009, he came forward, but he was on death row. Russ was sentenced to death May 14, 2009. Wait, let's go back for a second. That article was from January of 2009, almost February. I think he knew that he was gonna die. And so he tried his best. I don't know if I would take his word, but I have chills right now, this is crazy. So that's really the current state with this case. I know I didn't really solve it. I wasn't really sure that I was gonna be able to solve anything. I mean, it's 
unsolved for a reason. Like I said, if you wanna see more videos like this in the future, just comment that down below. Make sure you give the video a like if you did find it interesting. The shout outs that we're gonna be in this week are gonna go for next week. So like I said, guys, just be on the lookout for that. Keep commenting positive stuff and I'll be choosing some positive comments for next week and anyone who rocks the Positive Friday merchandise brand, as always, that's positivefriday.com. I will see you guys later. Peace out. Yeah.